Good morning, sir. Can you see and hear me? I can. Thank you. Thank you very much. This morning, we're going to hear from Mandy Talbot. Yeah. God, that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Uh, can you give your full name, please? Mrs. Mandy Talbot. Mrs. Talbot, you should have in front of you a witness statement. That's um, correct. That has your name on the front, dated the 31st of May 2023. Is that correct? Correct. Um, could I ask you to turn to the final substantive page on that witness statement? That's page 36. I have. Yes. Uh, is that your signature it at the is. bottom of that page? Thank you very much. And is that statement true to the best of your knowledge and belief? It is uh, as at the time. Thank you. And I believe there are some small changes that you would like to add now. That is correct. Uh, please do feel free to make those amendments now. If I may, uh, I wish to make some additional comments, having received 1,661 pages of further disclosure that affects my original statement. I'm now aware that I was updated on the case of Wilson Home in March of 2004 by Mr. Jim Criss. This was after Mr. Coyne's initial review and his comments upon the response from Fujitsu had been received. As can be seen from the documentation now disclosed to me, Mr. Criss had concerns about the case and Mr. Coyne's initial opinion and response to Fujitsu. It was for that reason that counsel was instructed by agents. I've now also seen FUJ00121724 email to Colin Lenton Smith and report on Cleveland's FUJ000 80715 of Mr. Holmes. I was very surprised by the contents of the former and agree that if Fujitsu had been brought into the matter earlier could have resulted in a possible preservation of relevant data and a more conducive engagement with Mr. Coyne. In paragraph 24 of my statement refers to my request to Bon Pierce not to issue cases involving Horizon. It meant cases where subpost masters had alleged that the Horizon system was at fault in response to an action to recover debt. As now disclosed to me from December of 2005 at POL 007426 email to David Smith of Poll, I was seeking to set up an appropriate system for compiling data and investigating cases prior to the business sending matters out to civil litigation agents. Despite pressing, this was ultimately rejected on the basis of cost. Thank you very much, Mr. Talbot. Um, that statement, that is WITN 08500100, uh, will be published by the inquiry in due course. Um, those amendments have been made because, as you've said, the witness statement was taken some time ago now. Um, I, I will take you thematically through various things, and if any of those points jump out at you at the relevant time, then please do feel free sure. to say as well. Thank you. You're here today because you were a lawyer at the post office. Um, one thing that isn't entirely clear from your witness statement is whether you qualified as a solicitor and, and when that was. Are you able to assist on that? Ooh, I am qualified as a solicitor. I joined the post office in 1990. I believe I qualified about 18 months before that. I can't, after this period of time, recall the precise date. Um, you, you've said in your statement that you worked at Cameron McKenna and Wild Sapped. Yes. Uh, were those training as a solicitor or some other role? Uh, no, that was as a junior solicitor. I did my training contract or articles as it was then referred to at Douglas Jones and Mercer of Swansea 
uh, a provincial firm. Thank you. And you joined the post office in 1990 as a legal assistant, is that right? Correct. Um, you were in the civil litigation department. Correct. And during your time, it became Royal Mail Legal Services as well. Yes. Um, I think you spent over 20 years in the department, is that correct? Correct. Um, briefly, can you tell us what kinds of cases that you were involved in um, working for the post office other than the kinds of cases that we're going to be talking about today? A whole range. Uh, usually small county court matters under the Postal Services Act, injunctions, giving training courses, issuing proceedings on debt actions, but I'd also done personal injury work, uh, rent arrear cases, also used to assist um, chairman's office if they wanted information and freedom of information action cases. In 2011, you became part of the regulation team at the Royal Mail Group. Correct. Uh, was that something different? Entirely. I no longer functioned as a solicitor. I became within legal services department. I was somebody with legal <coughs> knowledge working for Royal Mail Group itself in a team set up to arrange for the flotation of Royal Mail Group as a company. And I think you took redundancy in 2014. In the September, yes. Um, did you work elsewhere after that or? No, unfortunately for family reasons, um, it was necessary for me to help support my father-in-law, my mother, and ultimately, um, other relatives. Thank you. I want to begin by looking at the structure of your team. Um, during Mr. Castleton's case, you've been described, I think, as the litigation team leader, or at one point, principal lawyer. Mm. Um, can you assist us with that role? Prior to 2004, um, legal services had a large number of in-house solicitors. In 2004, the then solicitor, who was in effect at the head of legal services, offered everybody and anybody who wanted it redundancy on quite good terms. I think, to the best of my recollection, only four members of staff in the whole of legal services were prevented from um, accepting the offer of redundancy. There was no structure involved at all, and so teams were in effect decimated. Um, so that was 2004. Um, I had been a, a team leader in the postal services team, which as the name suggests, dealt primarily with, with matters pertaining to Postal Services Act, um, items lost in the post, county court actions, some deck action against parties who had contracted with Royal Mail for postal services. But after 2004, in effect, although I had the title, um, the number of people working within legal services meant the title was a non-entity. Um, so you had a general counsel, did you? She was referred to uh, this Catherine Churchyard as the solicitor, but in effect performed the role of general counsel, though I don't believe she ever had a permanent position on the board. And underneath the general counsel, um, it, would it be right to say that you were the principal lawyer dealing with civil matters? No, that's no. not correct. There was the head of, le of civil litigation, and I was never the head of civil litigation. Who was that, sorry? Uh, at the beginning, Mr. Joe Ashton, Claire Wardle, um, Biddy Wiles, Rebecca Mantle, so I was there for a long time. 
And uh, then when I was a team leader, I was on uh, a direct report to Joe Ashton. But after that role disappeared, I was on a direct report to Claire Wardle, Busy Wiles, Rebecca Mantle, and they in turn uh, would report upwards. So although described as the litigation team leader or principal lawyer, um, it was in fact the case that you weren't the leader at all. No. Um, was there somebody in an equivalent position dealing with criminal matters? The equivalent to myself, uh, there were, prior to the, the reduction in headcount, there were many caseworkers like myself in the criminal law department, but the head of criminal law was Rob Wilson. And who would his equivalent have been in your team? That would have been Joe Ashton, Claire Wardle, Biddy Wiles, and Rebecca Mantle. The impression that you've given is that those who remained in the team after 2004 were few in number and quite stretched. Is that fair? That is correct. Can you, do you know why the redundancies were offered at that stage? To the best of my recollection, this is probably my opinion, in 2004, there was a desire on the part of the corporation to have a reduction in headcount. And I believe that is the reason for the offer of mass redundancy. In respect of actions against sub-postmasters, whether they be criminal or civil, uh, was there anybody in the team that had an overview of the work that was going on? Neither in the, not in civil litigation or, but this is just speculation, our prosecution team, because prosecution was an entirely different specialism. And in the civil litigation team, we're going to see that you were involved in a number of actions against sub-postmasters. Did anyone have oversight or a general view of all of those cases? No. In terms of Horizon, did you receive any training on the system? I received a one-hour training course uh, very, very early on. Um, with people trying to explain lots of moving parts on a whiteboard, and that was it. And do you think that was a similar experience of your colleagues within the team? Within civil litigation, yes. I can't speak as to any of the other teams. I want to talk about your knowledge of bugs, errors and defects in the mm -hmm. system. Um, you've said this morning You've been receiving a, a number of different documents um, before today. Mm -hmm. um, but apart from the corrections that you made this morning, um, are you content with the words that are in your witness statement? Generally, yes. Um, did you give consideration to terms that were used? For example, um, you have described in respect of the Horizon system, um, that it was infallible. Um, is that something that you were told? In if possibly not the word infallible, but I was given the distinct impression that it was a, a perfect system and that any minor bug or glitch was quickly identified, its footprint uh, made plain, and that these were things that uh, Fujitsu would search for if we ever asked them for information as to the running of a particular branch. Um, infallible is quite a strong word. It is. Um, were you given such a strong assurance and who by? 
I cannot put a name, but I got the distinct impression that this was a system of which Fujitsu were incredibly proud. And as I say anecdotally in my statement, there was a suggestion that they were so proud that there was a desire to sell it to other organizations. You said you got the impression. Where did that impression come from? Numerous dealings with Fujitsu over the years. Who in particular did you deal with at Fujitsu? Usually when I dealt with Fujitsu, it would be in respect of a particular piece of litigation or case. Uh, but also, as you can see from the correspondence, uh, they were copied in to numerous matters that I was dealing with, both with themselves and Paul. Who in particular do you think gave you the impression that the system was as uh, infallible? I would be lying if I tried to put a name to it after this period of time. I'm very sorry. Can I take you to your witness statement? That's WITN 08500100, please. Uh, and it's page 27 of that statement. It's paragraph 62. Thank you. You say there at the bottom of the page, Looking back, I obviously have concerns about the cases I was involved in, uh, knowing now that there were problems with the Horizon system. Uh, but that is with hindsight and the knowledge that it uh, that has come into the public domain. At the time, over the page, thank you. At the time when civil litigation was instructed to obtain repayment of money by poll, uh, via legal agents, we genuinely believe the position adopted by Fujitsu. Um, can you tell us when it is that you have obtained, um, you, you say, with hindsight, with the information from the public domain since? Um, since it, when did you know that it was not infallible? The case of Bates and the increasing amount of publicity about the Horizon system in the press. Do you really think that it was not until Bates that you didn't have sufficient information to cast serious doubts on the reliability of the Horizon system? I left civil litigation in January of 2011 to go into a very different world, very uh, labor-intensive job. I didn't really think anything about Horizon from the time I entered Royal Mail Group uh, as a non-lawyer to the time of the eventual class action. During the years that you were working in civil litigation though, 2004, 2005, 2006, 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010, uh, did you not feel you had enough information to cast doubt on the reliability of the Horizon system? I really, really didn't. In 2010, looking at the additional documentation that's been supplied, I believe, and this is just my opinion, that concerns were maybe arising within Paul itself. But, um, you know, even through to the, the summer of 2010 with the Rod Ismay report, and I know there has been serious criticism of that, we were still being assured that the system was robust and fit for purpose. Who by? Well, there were, there was Mr. Rod Ismay himself and uh, the other senior partners to which his report were copied to. Okay, well, we'll get to that report in due course. But 
is it your evidence then that internally within the post office you were being convinced that the horizon system was robust? I can only speak as to the situation within civil litigation. I cannot speak as to the actual position in post office limited at the time. But you, you spoke earlier uh, of being reassured by Fujitsu, mm -hmm. uh, and now you've mentioned Mr. Ismay. Uh, so was it from outside and also within that you were being reassured about the robustness of Horizon? From within Post Office Limited and Fujitsu, yes. I want to begin with the Cleveleys case that we looked at before the summer break. Can we look at poll 00118236, please? Uh, we're here in March of 2004. Could we scroll down, please? And there's an email from Jim Cruz to yourself. Can you tell us who Jim Cruz was, please? He was a member of my team. Formerly, he had been a member of the prosecution team. And very unusually, a number of years earlier, he had transferred from that specialism over into civil litigation. He is there summarising the case of Mrs. Wollstoneholm. He says that it started back on the 17th of January 2001. He says there in the first paragraph, uh, at that time the losses were £14,000 and the sub-postmistress was refusing to make them good, blaming the losses on the Horizon system, which had been introduced in February 2000 at her office. If we look at the third paragraph, the final sentence there, it says, Mrs. Wollstoneholm asked for proof that the losses uh, were her fault and caused by the computer failure. She also asked for copies of all error notices, but Chesterfield said that these were not available. Can we go over the page, please? Um, the second line there says, the CC, that's the counterclaim, uh, is that the contract was wrongly terminated, that the computer system was unfit for its purpose and throws in Human Rights Act uh, and other regulations as part of the counterclaim. If we go down to the fourth paragraph, he summarises there at the end of that paragraph, he says, she declined to settle, saying that the losses were not accepted as her fault, uh, but let the post office remove all the equipment other than the computer equipment. The next paragraph, if we could scroll down slightly, thank you very much, says, since then, uh, so this is a, about uh, an offer to settle, uh, the report of the computer expert, Best Practice Limited, based on the available call logs, has been received, and as you all are aware, is unfavorable and unflattering to Fujitsu, if not actually hostile. In light of the report, which cannot really be challenged, I do not think that Paul will be able to prove, even on the balance of probabilities, that the losses were the fault of the sub-postmistress and our agents are still concerned about the lack of evidence for the losses. Next paragraph. He says uh, the advice that he is going to give the post office, he says about halfway down that final paragraph, I intend, therefore, to advise that the post office should pay Mrs. Wollstoneholm or pay into court the figure of three months remuneration plus interest on the basis that, although it's unlikely that Paul can now prove the losses were her fault alone, as per the contract for services, Paul, the post office can give three months notice without giving reasons, and this is all she'll be able to obtain by way of damages in any event if she takes the matter to trial. Um, so you were aware in March 2004 that there was this case uh, against Mrs. Wollstoneholm and, and that it was her case that the uh, Horizon system was at fault. Is that yes, right? Yes, correct. And also that there was an expert report that was unfavorable to the post office. Correct. Uh, why is uh, Mr. Cruz updating you in this email? Is this your first involvement in that case? I believe it was my first involvement and it would have been part of Jim's preparation for leaving legal services via the mass redundancy. So is he passing the case on to you? 
The case was actually out with Waitsman's, who were one of the firms of external agents. In effect, he was passing on to me the in-house role in respect of the case. Um, that somewhat minimises the role of the post office, though, because you are instructing Waitman's, aren't you? At that time, um, because of the uh, mass redundancy, Post Office Limited were entitled to take matters directly out to our external legal agents um, without referring the matter to in-house solicitors. This case, I believe, might be slightly different in that I believe from, the inter from this document that Jim himself had issued proceedings for the return of um, Post Office Limited property at her branch. And it was only thereafter that it was referred out to Waitman's, our agents. Trying to understand how things would operate in the generality of cases, um, are you saying then that the external law firms had significant discretion as to how they carried out their practice and were not instructed? There was this um, massive redundancy followed by um, quite a lot of work that wasn't conducted by myself setting up agreements with a network of external agents under which Post Office Limited could give instructions directly to external agents. And in so far as we within civil litigation were usually involved, it was a matter of keeping an eye on the costs and if anything unusual or untoward occurred, we would then try and assist uh, the external agents to the best of our ability to achieve a successful resolution for Paul. Is it therefore your evidence that you weren't in some way directing the actions of the law firm with regards to, for example, settlement? Until such time as um, this email, I would have had no involvement in this case whatsoever. Um, thereafter, given the concerns expressed, um, I probably would have endorsed their decision to go to external counsel. Uh, can we look at the actual report from Best Practice Group? That's Mr. Coyne's report. It is WITN 09020115. It's a report that's well known to the inquiry. We, we've heard from Mr. Coyne. If we look at page two, please. Uh, he says, I've been contacted by Waitman's Vizards, a law firm representing Post Office Counters Limited and Mrs. Julie Wollstonehome, an individual. Um, were you aware that Mr. Coyne had been instructed jointly by both the post office and by Mrs. Wollstonehome? Not at the time of the email that we previously looked at. Not at the time I made my original statement, but with the additional disclosure, I am now aware. Um, were you aware at the time? I mean, this report is January 2004. Presumably, you would have received this report? Personally, no. Not until such time as I received the email communication from Jim Cruz. Then I would have been made aware of this report. So on receiving his email of the 17th of March 2004, did you then read the expert report? I did. You did. And were you therefore aware that it was a jointly appointed expert report? 
at that time I would have been, yes. yes. Uh, and were you aware of what that meant in respect of the importance of it, in respect of the fairness of it? Yes. Uh, what did you understand by the importance of it and the fairness of it? That the report or initial observations, as he actually terms it, uh, would have been created uh, for the assistance and benefit of the court. Can we scroll down the page, please? I'll just highlight some parts of this report. Mm -hmm. Um, we've already looked at them. This is where Mr. Coyne refers to the statement from Ms. Elaine Tagg, the retail network manager, uh, and it's a section from her witness statement in those proceedings where she said, Mrs. Wollstoneholm persisted in telephoning the Horizon System help desk in relation to any problems which she had with the system generally. These problems related to use and general operation of the system and were not technical problems relating to the system. Uh, Mr. Coyne then says, this, in my opinion, is not a true representation of the evidence that I have had access to. Of the 90 or so fault logs that I have reviewed, 63 of these are without doubt system-related failures. Only 13 could be considered as Mrs. Wollstoneholm uh, calling the wrong support help desk requesting answers to how do I type training questions. He says, the majority of the system's issues were screen locks, freezes, and blue screen errors, which are clearly not the fault of Mrs. Wollstoneholm's making, but most probably due to faulty computer, hardware, software, interfaces, or power. In fact, a detailed view of call 11021413, dated the 2nd of November 2000, Ms. Tagg may have witnessed firsthand the style of system problems that Mrs. Wollstoneholm experienced in her operation of the system. The fault log notes that Elaine reports that one of the counters has a blue screen with a message, and it gives the message, and was advised by the operator to reboot. Could we go over the page, please? He then gives his opinion. He says system, he refers, for example, to system freezing. System freezing, which is most probably due to either the hardware or interfaces crashing, or alternatively, fully saturated communication lines. Uh, if we scroll down to the final three paragraphs on that page, he says, it's interesting and certainly warrants further examination that in November 2000, the system freezing is reported again with the support operator st stating, they all freeze, but if it gets bad, give us a call and we will investigate. From the 31st of October, there seems to be a number of logs which talk of large discrepancies in stock figures, trial balances, with all sorts of figures showing minus figures. Uh, he references a call log and he says, uh, there's a comment noted by the support operative that the postmistress advised that this is an intermittent problem occurring since the counters were upgraded. Uh, although the documents do not list an upgrade taking place, it does seem that these large reported discrepancies occur very frequently and shortly after the noted upgrade. If we go over the page, please, he then summarizes his opinion and he says, from a computer system installation perspective, it is my opinion that the technology installed at the Cleveland sub-post office was clearly defective in the elements of its hardware, software, or interfaces. Um, clearly defective is quite a strong term, isn't it? Yes. Did, did that not surprise you at the time? Mr. Coyne had created this report, or so I believe, on the basis of a review of the pleadings and the HSH logs. Subsequent to this document being received, uh, Fujitsu then took the opportunity to comment upon the same. I believe, though I haven't been shown a copy, that Mr. Coyne then commented upon their opinion and ultimately Fujitsu um, wrote to 
legal services, again disputing the conclusions reached by Mr. Coyne, but being open to inviting him to come and visit engineers and their facilities to take him through the horizon system. You, at this stage, a, a qualified solicitor who had been practicing for some time, you receive an independent expert's report, jointly appointed, that says that the technology installed was clearly defective. Did that not cause you to pause a little on your view of the robustness of the Horizon system? It was expressed to be an initial report, and I took the view that Fujitsu being so open to inviting him in to discuss the matters further was further evidence of their conviction of the robustness of their system. And it didn't cause you to be worried in any way about the impact that this might have? I was advised by Fujitsu that the system in 2004 was very different to the system in 2000 under which the 2000 system, data was disposed of, I believe, after a period of 18 months. The system in 2004, I was assured, was much more robust. And who, who told you that? That would have been the people I was speaking to in Fujitsu. And can you please give their names? Oh. Um. After this period of time, I'm sorry, I can't. Okay, well, uh, perhaps over the lunch break, you can look at the papers that you've been given and you might yes. uh, recall more. Um, but. In respect of, say, the period then, 2000 to 2004, were you not worried about the impact that this opinion may have had? No, because I was assured it was on a, a unique set of facts that had occurred in 2000, and in 2004 it simply couldn't happen. So you weren't at all worried? No. Uh, no? No. Well, can we look at FUJ 00121637, please? This is an email from Jan Holmes of Fujitsu to Colin Lenton Smith. And he says, Jim Cruz has taken early retirement, so I ended up speaking to Mandy Talbot, who was his boss. Now, you're described there as Jim Cruz's boss. Is that right? Or Correct. Right? That's correct. Um, the postmistress rejected the offer. Uh, that was made to her some time ago and a trial date has been set. The post office are still taking advice as to how best to deal with this and Mandy's view slash belief was that the safest way to manage this is to throw money at it and get a confidentiality agreement side, signed. She is not happy with the expert's report as she considers it to be not well balanced and wants, if possible, to keep it out of the public domain. This is unlikely to happen if it goes to court. She was talking about taking the option to admit the report and concede the contents are an accurate reflection of what happened. The Horizon System help desk transcripts are an accurate reflection of what happened. It's just the expert opinion is the problem. Uh, the liability question is removed, and then it's just about how much to go away and keep your mouth shut. Now, Stephen Dilley's evidence to this inquiry was that you speak in a way that it is eminently quotable, was, was his words. Uh, are those your words uh, that are quoted there? How much to go away and keep your mouth shut? It's a minute created, sorry, it's communication created by Jan Holmes. Really doesn't sound like me. No. I mean um, Possibly I am eminently quotable, but I really don't think I would have expressed myself in those terms. Um, 
Why would that be the best approach if you weren't at all worried about the report from Mr Coyne? We have a situation where the original documentation in Castleton, I'm uh, sorry, the original documentation uh, with Mrs Wollstonehome was relating back to 2000. The original documentation plus the original uh, records on the Horizon system uh, were no longer available. All, the, all that was left was the HSH logs. We had members of Fujitsu who were happy to create witness statements to go to court to adduce to the effective working of the system, but we did also have a jointly appointed expert, albeit creating only a preliminary view. I took the view that if the matter went to court, it was unlikely that the evidence of Fujitsu would be persuasive. As such, the effective way of dealing with such litigation is try to re resolve it by making an economic settlement. That all sounds very reasonable, Mrs. Talbot, if I may say. Um, but why confidentiality agreement? Why keep your mouth shut? Why would you want to hide what had happened in this case? I had absolutely no desire to hide what had happened in this case. If the matter was settled, there would be no need for the expert's report to be disclosed in court. If the matter were not capable of being settled, then it would have been disclosed in court. It was an unhelpful statement you are describing here to Mr. Holmes that you would like uh, to sign, uh, Mrs. Wollstonehome to sign a confidentiality agreement uh, and the words there, whether they're exactly the phrase you used or not, are effectively to silence her. Um, if this was simply a matter of not having the right documentation to prove the case, why would that have been necessary? The settlement negotiations, I believe, were dealt with by Waitsman's. Um, I'm not certain how much more involvement I had in this matter after this time. So you did not mind if publicity were shined upon this case? No, I mean... Nothing to hide? It, in effect, if it had gone into court at that time, then it might well have had an impact upon Paul and its relationship with Fujitsu, but so be it. Absolutely nothing to hide. No. Didn't want to hide it from the public view. No. Can we please look at poll 00118229, please? This is an advice on evidence and quantum. If we turn to the final page, page 18, If we look at the bottom of the page, we can see it's written by Council at 9 St. John Street in Manchester. Um, can we turn back, please, to the beginning? And perhaps we can start at page 2, paragraph 4, 26th of July 2004. Um, the author, Council, writes, the Horizon computer system did not operate smoothly at all times, and a support helpline was set up manned by personnel from the company which supplied the system. Mrs. Wollstonehome claims that she had enormous difficulties with her computer system and that it frequently malfunctioned, causing inaccuracies in stock and other figures to arise. She claims that she repeatedly contacted both the helpline and the post office about problems she was encountering, but little effective was done to assist. In November 2000, Mrs. Wollstonehome became so disillusioned with the computer system that she decided to stop using it. This was in breach of her obligations to the post office and she was duly suspended. 
prior to this point, a number of errors and or deficiencies had arisen in relation to Mrs. Walton Holmes' post office accounts. If we continue over the page to paragraph 10, please. Uh, Council continues, Mrs. Walsenholm has defended the proceedings, claiming the computer system installed by the post office was defective, and this was, in fact, the cause of the losses recorded within her accounts. Uh, paragraph 11, the trial of this matter, now about one month away. A joint computer export BERT's report has been obtained. The, this report concludes from the limited records available that the computer system installed by the post office did appear defective. Over the page, please, to paragraph 13. I'm asked to advise in relation to quantum and evidence. I'm asked to take into particular account that the post office is anxious for the negative computer experts report to be given as little publicity as possible. Now, that is directly contrary to the evidence that you have just given. Uh, why do you say that was not your instruction? I did not instruct counsel in this matter. It would have been uh, our external agents. It's true that adducing the report in court would have not been great for Post Office Limited, but ultimately if it had to happen, it had to happen. If your view at the time was nothing to hide, mm -hmm. why on earth would you, your solicitors have got the impression that the post, office is, the post office is anxious for the negative computer experts report to be given as little publicity as possible? Where do you say that was coming from? I can't comment. You did nothing to give them that impression that that was your instruction? I genuinely cannot remember after this period of time. I'm sorry. We'll continue going through the report, and perhaps some of that might refresh your memory. Can we look at paragraph 17, please? In view of the negative experts report in this case regarding the computer system in place, Mrs. Walton Holmes suggestion that the errors that arose were the result of defects in the computer system must be taken seriously. It is sufficient to place genuine and significant doubt on the evidence relied upon by the post office. Uh, was that communicated back to you, the council, um, council's position? that there was genuine and significant doubt on the evidence being relied upon by the post office? I cannot recall. Can we look at paragraph 49, please? That's the bottom of page 15, top of page 16. It says there, on the basis of the above, it can be concluded that the post office claim against Mrs. Walson Home will fail, save for the return of the equipment which she has possibly retained. Her claim against the post office in respect of failure to give proper notice is likely to succeed. Uh, what is the appropriate course of conduct in the circumstances, particularly given the desire of those instructing me and the post office to avoid, if possible, publication of the negative experts report in the public arena? Now, if the post office had as much confidence in the Horizon system as your evidence has been earlier today, why on earth would they want to avoid publication of that experts report? because I think it might have affected the relationship between Post Office Limited and Fujitsu, but that is purely my opinion. I can't speak to Post Office Limited's intentions. Having read Jim Cruz's email, having read the expert report, um, at this point in time, was it not dawning on you that the Horizon system might not be as infallible as you indeed thought? I can categorically say no. At that time, it certainly didn't. 
I'm going to move on to the case of Lee Castleton, and I'm going to start in 2005. Can we look at poll 00107423, please? Thank you. Can we start at page seven of this? It's a chain of emails. Thank you. Um, at the bottom of that page, we have an email from Stephen Dilley to Cheryl Woodward and copy to you. Could we just scroll slightly above that, please? Just to see who, who it's to and from. Um, can you tell us the relationship? Why Cheryl Woodward and I think it, is it mm. to Cheryl Woodward and copied to you? Cheryl Woodward uh, worked in the depart one of the departments in Post Office Limited that were entitled to instruct regional agents like Bon Pierce directly. Ergo, the instructions to uh, issue proceedings against Mr. Castleton were authorised by Ms. Woodward. So that's a direct instruction from uh, somebody within the post office who is not a lawyer. Correct. But copy to you who is a lawyer. No. Uh, this is a communication from Stephen Dilley after he had taken over conduct of the Castleton matter uh, going back directly to his original instructing, to his firm's original uh, instructing party, Cheryl Woodward, copied into me because of uh, the concerns over his firm permitting judgment in default on a massive <coughs> potential counterclaim being issued. Um, you were a lawyer involved in civil litigation in the post office, Sorry. being copied into an email from Mr. Dilley, who was uh, the law firm acting for Bon Pierce, the law firm instructed in this case, right. presumably copied in because you were a lawyer. Is that right? I was copied in because of the fact that they had permitted judgment to be entered in default. Uh, this meant that it wasn't being dealt with as business as usual. They had to come back to us at legal services and explain what had occurred. For that reason, I was now being copied in. So was there a threshold of seriousness before which it wouldn't get to the legal team, but beyond which it would have to be copied in or the law, or the legal team involved in some way? I had nothing to do with setting up the contracts for outsourcing. Um, but by any ream, permitting a potential counterclaim of a quarter of a million pound to be entered against your client would justify uh, contracting legal services, yes. Uh, and we're here in October 2005. Was this the first involvement that you had with the Castleton case? There's a possibility that I might have been asked for contacts of people within Post Office Limited by the solicitor who was dealing with the case prior to Mr. Dilley. If we look at the first paragraph in his case summary, he says, the Post Office's claim is for approximately £27,000 plus interest and costs in respect of net losses Clearly, Mr. Castleton is contractually responsible for any losses that the post office makes caused by negligence or error. However, the real issue is whether there has been any real shortfall or whether this shortfall has really been generated by computer error. To win, the post office must show that there has been a real shortfall. If we go over the page, he summarizes some reports that have been obtained. Uh, sorry, over one more page, thank you. Um, to page nine. There, there's a blank page that follows, but it's over the page. Thank you. He refers to some reports that have been obtained by Mr. Castleton, one from uh, Bentley and Jennison, one from White and Hoggard. Um, he says about halfway down that bottom paragraph um, that Mr. Castleton's defense appears to hold potential merit 
based on the limited documentation. Uh, this is a quote from Bentley Jennison um, from, from their report. Uh, he's passing on that information to you. It says White and Hoggard reach a similar conclusion in their report. Um, can we go back, please, to higher up the email chain, page five? The bottom of page five, please. This seems to be you forwarding that email to various people. Can you assist us with who the recipients are? Carol King, Nikki Sherratt, Jennifer Robson. Uh, Claire Wardle was my immediate line manager at the time. Nikki Sherratt was, I believe, uh, head of commercial uh, might even have been performing the role of acting head of legal. Uh, John Legg and Carol King were Post Office Limited employees. And I'm going to read from your covering email. If we could scroll down the page over to page seven, please. It'll be over the page again because I think these were originally hard copies that were photocopied, which explains the blank pages. You say, this is a case where the adequacy of the evidence which, poll, which the post office has in support of it, case against Castleton is being challenged, and his counterclaim dwarfs the size of the claim. The adequacy of the records obtained from the Horizon system is being challenged. As the business chose to give summary termination instead of three months' notice, it is required to physically prove the loss. If the horizon evidence is not up to the job, this will have serious ramifications for the business. Uh, you were recognizing there that if there was a successful challenge to the horizon system, it would have serious ramifications. Is that right? Correct. Yes. Yes. Uh, and is that following your experience from the Cleveleys case? where the Horizon case was, the reliability of Horizon was called into question. No, no, it really wasn't. I mean, my major concern about the matter of Castleton was the sheer size of the counterclaim, quarter of a million pound, and the cost of putting a full defence together uh, because I was concerned that proceedings had been issued in the first place because the paper documentation that should have been in place prior to proceedings being issued wasn't. But the final sentence there, if the horizon evidence is not up to the job, this will have serious ramifications for the business. It seems as though your concern actually is, is about the adequacy of the horizon system and the ramifications that that may have. Is that wrong? That's what I said at the time, but in reality, it was the sheer size of the counterclaim and the cost and expense that we knew we would be put to in defending a full challenge. And we've seen before council's advice about the post office wishing to avoid publicity. We saw that time and again in relation to the Cleveleys case. Isn't this much of the same thing? No. Can we look at the first page of this chain, please, and the bottom of the first page? We have there an email from Dave Hulbert to Karl Marx, not the Karl Marx, a different Karl Marx. Can you tell us who, who they were? Um, I have no idea who Karl Marx was, which is surprising, given his name. Um, Dave Hulbert, I believe, worked in, I believe, worked in Fujitsu, or was a liaison between Paul and Fujitsu. We also have there Keith Baines. <sighs> That's a, a higher up the chain, in fact. I genuinely, I can't remember their, their title. As he was the Horizon the contract time. manager at the post office. Do you recall that? Um, it, looking at that bottom email, though, can we scroll down, please? It's 
Carl to, to Dave, it says uh, in that second paragraph, I've also copied below a response you provided some weeks ago relating to a different case, Smallbridge, about the system creating discrepancies, and it would be worth having your view on whether this provides useful supporting evidence, particularly encountering the experts' report referred to in Stephen Dilley's email. Now, do you recall a case of Smallbridge where there were uh, discrepancies? Absolutely not. But what you have to appreciate is that there was never ever an overriding system that gave civil litigation visibility of all post office limited matters. I mean, if we look at the top, if we go back a page to page one, we see Carol King at the post office. Jennifer Robson, Debt Recovery Section Manager. Um, they're all in receipt of this chain of emails. Mm -hmm. uh, was that not something that was ever brought to your attention? I cannot recall after this period of time. If we stick with page three, please, we can see at the bottom of page three, this is Carol to Dave, and he says that he's copied um, certain wording from the Smallbridge case. And it says there at the bottom, in summary, the system is very robust. In our experience, it very seldom loses transactions unless equipment is physically removed from the site. If it does lose transactions, post office procedures should quickly identify discrepancies and they should be followed through with help desk assistance within a week. Um, now, do you know where that draft wording came from? Are you able to assist? Is that a phrase that you heard, a, a form of words that you heard repeated? No, it's, it's not. At this time, were you telling people about, for example, the Cleveleys case that you had, where a joint expert had said that that simply isn't right? I wasn't telling people about the Cleveleys case. As far as we were concerned, that had been concluded. You had an independent, jointly appointed expert who was saying that describing it as robust simply wasn't right. Do you think that it might have been worth at that period of, during that period of time to have told more people within the post office? It was expressed as to be a preliminary report. Um, I viewed it as a case in isolation. Can we look at poll 00070574, please? This is the 7th of November 2005, so we're still in 2005. An email from Stephen Dilley to Stephen Lister. And he summarizes much the same. He says, um, as you are the relationship partner for the Royal Mail, I thought it would be helpful to update you in relation to a case I'm dealing with uh, for them in, the case Mandy, in case Mandy Talbot mentions it. I recently inherited this case from Denise Gamak when she left the firm, who in turn Inherited it, inherited it from somebody else. Um, if we scroll down to the third paragraph, please. He says there that Mr. Castleton has obtained two expert reports which conclude that the post office's Horizon computer system, despite the suspense account entry, has failed to recognize the entry on the daily snapshot, and that Mr. Castleton, Castleton's defense appears to hold potential merit based on the limited documentation they have so far reviewed. Uh, they say further down the page, we take instructions from Cheryl Woodward, agent's debt team, Chesterfield, but Mandy Talbot is copied in on emails. I spoke to Mandy last week to take instructions, and her first question was why Bond Pierce had issued the claim when liability was unclear. Uh, so it seems clear that you did provide instructions to Stephen Dilley from that phrase. At that stage, yes. I informed Mandy that my colleagues had expressed concern to Cheryl about issuing. And then we, if we could scroll down, there's a paragraph there about uh, snapshots missing, uh, certain information missing. And then it says this, it says, Mandy's next comment was that Cheryl may not have had authority to tell Laura to issue a claim, uh, but I was able to tell Mandy, that Cheryl had referred this question to her managers before instructing Laura to proceed. 
In any event, Mandy has instructed me to put forward an offer of mediation to try to settle the claim. Now, did your previous experience in the Cleveleys case um, influence you in some way on receiving that email, uh, on receiving that information, to, to want to settle this case as quickly as possible? No, we wanted to settle the claim because uh, it was one where a counterclaim had been issued for a quarter of a million pounds. And even in 2005, that was a serious amount of money. I was also concerned by the fact that when proceedings had been issued, the paper uh, in support of the claim wasn't in apple pie order. That was why I was concerned that instructions had been given to issue proceedings in the first place. So it continues to be your evidence that the Cleveleys case pay, uh, was in no way relevant to your thinking that is my in evidence. the Carstens case. Can we look at poll 00072402, please? We're still in November 2005. This is an attendance note um, made by Bon Pierce. J. MS1 is Julian Summerhays. I believe he, he is uh, from Bond Pierce. It says there, JMS1 wanted to know whether there was any evidence at all of the monies that were alleged by Royal Mail to be outstanding. MT, that's yourself, I believe, Mandy Talbot, indicating uh, that she had gone through the file but was certainly not able to find any manual documents to confirm this. Uh, JMS1 talking through uh, a few of the issues in the reply and defence and counterclaim and saying he had slightly amended that from the version uh, that had been sent through earlier. Uh, and it ends on this. It, it ends, uh, she was still not sure why the firm had been given instructions to issue. Uh, she will revert soonest. Uh, and in fact, it also says MT, uh, that's yourself, talking about getting tired with this case. Why were you tired with this case at that time? It was taking up an awful lot of uh, resource. Ordinarily, sub postmasters cases, for me personally, would take up one, two hours a week maximum. Uh, this case was uh, be beginning to take up substantial periods of time. Uh, whether I expressed being tired with it. It's, it's quite possible I did use that word. Was it that Mr. Castleton wasn't accepting uh, a, a payout at that stage, like in the Cleveleys case? Absolutely not. Um, we're going to move now to 2006. Uh, so that might be an appropriate moment to take our mid-morning break. It's slightly early, but I think it, it is a natural break. Perhaps we that's could... fine. That's fine, Mr. Blake. What time should we resume? If we resume at eleven thirty, please. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Um, Mrs. Talbot, before we broke, I, I'm going to summarise the position as far as I understand it. O on Cleveleys, your evidence is. You didn't have anything to hide, is that right? Correct. Uh, in respect of Castleton, you wanted to settle Castleton because of the size of the counterclaim. Is that correct? And because uh, of missing paper documentation. Um, but in respect of Castleton, like Cleveleys, is it your evidence that you had nothing to hide? Absolutely nothing to hide. Um, can we look at poll 00072669, please? This is an attendance note that we looked at with Mr. Dilley, 24th of February 2006. Um, he summarises a telephone conversation that he had with you. Could we scroll down a little bit? I'll just read those two paragraphs. Um, he, he's recalling a discussion with you. He says, internally, the post office feels conflicted about which direction to go in with Castleton, in the Castleton case. The post office believes the horizon system is robust, but the downside is the cost in post offices' time and money improving a negative, i.e. that there are no faults, and that is expensive. 
For example, Mandy would need to get a report from Fujitsu, who apparently have difficulty writing in plain English, and get someone in the post office to review Fujitsu data to see if there are any anomalies. Uh, it goes on to say, it's Mandy's view that the post office must not show any weakness. And even if this case will cost a lot, there are broader issues at stake than just the Castleton claim. If the post office are seen to compromise on Castleton, then the whole system will come crashing down, i.e. it will egg on other sub-postmasters to issue speculative claims. Uh, pausing there, is that what you told Stephen Dilley in February of 2006? It may have been, as, as it expressed in paragraph one, post office genuinely believed that Horizon was a robust system. Um, and it felt, I believe post office felt the need uh, to demonstrate that it would take a firm line with any and all challenges to Horizon. And we have there in speech marks, so similar to the speech marks that we saw earlier in respect of keeping your mouth shut, it says the whole system will come crashing down. And it says Mandy knows that Mr. Castleton is talking to uh, Bargerji, the other sub postmaster bringing a Horizon boat based claim. The post office is clear line to the industry must be that we're taking a firm line with Castleton. She even said she thought it might be damaging to settle the claim on confidential terms rather than fight it and lose. Uh, so there seems to be a, a strengthening of the line towards Mr. Castleton. We've, we've gone from 2005 potential settlement to now making an example of Mr. Castleton. Yes, that is correct. It went from being a case, to the best of my recollection, that started off small supposed master deficiency massive potential counterclaim um, based on, so we believed, unsupported allegations about the Horizon system. By the February of 2006, however, it had sort of morphed into a test case on Horizon, despite itself. We believed that it was a pure accountancy issue in effect, but because of publicity sought, let's say it was becoming a test case on Horizon, even though our, it, that is not what we believe the case was about. If you had such confidence in Horizon and nothing to hide, mm -hmm. uh, why would you need to take such a hard line against Mr. Castleton? It wasn't necessarily against Mr. Castleton. I, I really do think it was driven by the size of the potential counterclaim, and that if he accept, had accepted any of the offers to mediate, I think things could have been resolved on a round table basis. Where there does it refer to the counterclaim being your motivation, the driving force in your case strategy? This is a document created by Mr. Stephen Dilley, and the disclosure to this inquiry has been very partial. I don't know whether in February of 2006, uh, I was in the position of uh, expressing strategy. There was, there was no litigation strategy within um, the civil litigation department on how to deal with these cases. There was no strategy coming down from on high from Post Office Limited on how to deal with these cases. Doesn't paragraph two there precisely set out the strategy that you wanted to adopt in Mr. Castleton's case? In this, in this instance, this particular piece of litigation. And where were you getting those instructions from? It says here, uh, I was getting them from Post Office Limited. Who was telling you that you needed to send a message to the industry? Was this your own view? Did it come from somewhere else? 
I think it was coming from Post Office Limited. But it was a very long time ago. Post Office Limited is a company name. It must have come from an individual. Who was it coming from, or individuals? I, I can't recall after this period of time, as I haven't had the advantage of having access to full sequential documentation. There is a conversation between yourself and Stephen Dilley in February 2006, uh, where he is quoting what he considers to be your view that the post office must not show any weakness. Um, is the strategy coming from you? I mean, it's quite a significant strategy that has implications for somebody's life. C can you try and assist with where this strategy is coming from? I believe it was coming from Post Office Limited, as expressed through me, and it was not a personal, it was just dealing with an individual uh, litigation case. And you have no recollection whatsoever where that direction was coming from? No. Can we look at poll 00070811, please? We're now in May 2006, an email from Stephen Dilley to yourself. Dear Mandy, I refer to our telephone conversation this afternoon and attach our draft cost schedule for your information. As discussed, this is partly a tactical document. Mr. Castleton wants to postpone mediation. Uh, the estimate should bring home the cost implications of doing that. If we continue to scroll down, you're the only name there, sorry, if we scroll up to the top, you're the only name from the post office that's in the addressees there. Yes. Yes. Um, so he seems to be discussing tactical approaches to the litigation with you. Is that a fair summary of what this email is aimed at? In this document, though I may well have sought um, instruction on it from my line manager and or Paul. If we scroll down to number four and five, please. Thank you. He says that I've estimated the total global costs at nearly £223,000, including VAT and disbursements. As discussed, the cost will be disproportionate to the amount of the claim, which is circa 27000 uh, but not as it currently stands the counterclaim, which is unspecified, but put at not more than £250,000. However, I would value the counterclaim as much lower. Uh, there is a risk, therefore, that if the post office win, a significant proportion of the cost may be disallowed on assessment because of proportionality. So disproportionate costs may be being spent on this litigation. And he says, as previously discussed, presumably with yourself, even if the post office wins, you may well find it difficult to enforce any judgment because of Castleton's asset position, which is at best unclear. However, <clears throat> from the post office's view, there are important broader implications at stake, such that the message it will send out to other sub-postmasters if the post office settle or are, are seen to pursue it vigorously. So once again, the, the earlier message was from February, we're now in May, uh, a message to other sub-postmasters being sent out in this litigation. Is that your recollection of the tactical approach that was being taken to that litigation at that time? At this stage, it had morphed, I think, from becoming a technical test case to an actual test case. And therefore, that is the position and the message that Paul wished to put out. Had you and the post office lost sight by that point of the fact that Mr. Castleton, an individual, was involved in this case? I don't believe so, because I seem to recall that at the beginning of the litigation, he did have insurance cover. I do not know whether that had expired by this time. But you were clearly spending what might be disproportionate costs on a case in order to pursue it for a wider goal. Is that 
a fair summary of the tactical approach that was being taken. This was still potentially a counterclaim for a quarter of a million pounds where Horizon had now been put in to question. <coughs> Therefore, Paul thought it was the appropriate tactic to take. But paragraph five suggests that actually the counterclaim isn't uh, the real important matter that it was at stake, but it was sending a message out to sub-postmasters. The counterclaim had not been amended at that stage. Uh, can we look at poll 00090437, please? Um, and this is a, a pile of different documents, so it, it's not in, I know the first page says advice, but if we look at p page 65, there's an email chain that appears there. At the bottom of page 65, please. We're now on the 21st of August, 2006. Uh, and this is an email from Tom Breezer of Bond Pierce to yourself, mm -hmm. copied to Stephen Dilly. So again, you're the only post office name at this stage that's being copied into these emails. It, it, are we to read into that that you had a significant handle on this case by that time? I was the person within civil litigation that was dealing with the matter vis-a-vis -vis Bon Pierce, but I was seeking instructions upwards uh, from senior officers within the Post Office Limited and keeping my line manager copied into relevant communications. Are you still unable to name any of those senior managers? Well, I've already given you the raft of managers within civil litigation. But in terms of who was providing you with the significant instructions to pass to Tom Beezer and Stephen Dilley, who, who was that? I would have to go through uh, what little disclosure there is to see who I was getting instructions from, if that correspondence hasn't, hasn't already been disclosed. If we scroll down over to the next page, please. This is the contents of Tom Beezer's email. It says, as we discussed last week, I'm writing to update you on certain points that came out of my discussions on the Castleton case with Richard Morgan of Maitland Chambers. He gives an overview and he says a further point made by Richard Morgan was that we should endeavour to move the main area of focus in the case away from the horizon system if possible. Uh, he then addresses further down the page Fujitsu. <clears throat> uh, he says, in this matter, Fujitsu are clearly going to play a role. I understand that Fujitsu are currently looking at the matters raised in the letter of the 25th of July 2006 from Castleton's lawyers. Uh, one of the pivotal issues in this matter will be the arithmetic used throughout, and I would like to know the answer from Fujitsu as soon as possible to the points raised by Castleton's lawyers. Is there any pressure you can bring to bear upon Fujitsu to cause them to answer this letter in the near future? I'll be most grateful if you would consider this. Uh, one other point raised by Richard was the integrity of the Fujitsu product generally. Just to confirm, I understand that Royal Mail slash Post Office know of no issues with the Fujitsu system and are confident that it operates correctly. Please discuss this with me if you have a different view. Uh, did you at this point say, well, I had this case, uh, the Cleveley's case, a joint expert was instructed, independently, uh, and he questioned its integrity? No, I did not. Um, why, at this stage, did the Cleveleys case seem to simply be forgotten about? Because I was of the opinion that the preliminary view by Mr Coyne uh, was created in a unique set of circumstances, given that the original data was no longer available, didn't consider it to be a full report because the offer from Fujitsu for him to come and uh, visit their sites and look all over the data was never communicated to him. So I didn't consider that it was a full and comprehensive report. Did you consider that only a full and comprehensive report 
uh, would have been uh, sufficient to uh, require passing on to your lawyers who are dealing with a complaint about the Horizon system? In all events, that full and comprehensive report never came into creation. And anything less than a full and comprehensive report you didn't think was sufficient to pass on to your legal That's correct. advisors. Uh, they had asked you directly here um, whether um, there are, well, he, he says there, I understand that Royal Mail slash Post Office know of no issues with the Horizon system. Did you not think at that point, or well, maybe I should be raising some issues with the Horizon system that I've learned about in my experience of other cases? There isn't any communication in the document that has been documents that have been disclosed in which any conversation between myself and Stephen uh, on that point is itemized. Um, I do not believe, to the best of my recollection, that I did mention the case of Wollstonestone to him. Can we now look at Poll 00069592, please. Uh, this is a document that I took Mr. Dilly to. I know that you saw Mr. Dilly's evidence and you've had sight of this document today. Yeah. Um, it's dated the 5th of September 2006. It's from BDO Stoy Hayward, who were instructed in the Castleton case on behalf of the post office. Could we go to the final page there, please? Um, sorry, actually, if we could scroll up slightly to the previous page. Thank you. It's that paragraph there, early indications of problems with the Horizon system. So it's on the 5th of September that they contact uh, Mr. Dilley and say, we found that there is some information, some indication of possible problems with Horizon from our initial review of the electronic information you sent us. Uh, was that communicated to you? at the time? I have no recollection of this document at all until a hard copy of it was handed to me this morning. Um, in terms of the BDO report, I'll take you to that shortly. Did you, you ultimately saw the BDO report, didn't you? In the additional disclosure, yes. So, so you hadn't seen it before this inquiry? I cannot recall seeing it. I'll get to the report shortly, um, but you are seen here on a number of different emails between um, the solicitors acting for the post office and yourself. Um, is it likely that on receiving a letter of this significance from BDO that they would have passed on or summarized that information for you? I can't answer that. Can we look at poll 00113909, please? If we scroll to the bottom, we're now in November, 9th of November 2006. There's an email from yourself. Can you assist us with that distribution list and, and why you would have been sending information about the Castleton case to that distribution list? Okay. Uh, Biddy Wiles by this time was my immediate line manager, Claire Wardle, uh, head of civil litigation, uh, Rod Ismay has already given evidence to this inquiry, uh, I used to communicate with these people regularly but after so many years I'm afraid I can't assist. Uh, are you able to assist, not, not with what their specific roles or duties were, but simply why it is that you would have chosen that group of individuals? Was there a particular group dealing with sub-postmaster cases? Was there a particular group that was interested in Horizon cases or something else? I cannot recall after this period of time why this selection. I can only conclude that they are people who had shown an interest, and it was for that reason, 
shown an interest or possibly participated, because I, I recall that Keith Baines had given witness evidence. Uh, and so I felt that they were an appropriate selection of parties to contact to communicate this information. Um, you haven't so far named any individuals who were providing you with instructions to pass on to uh, the post office's solicitors. Uh, does this assist in any way with identifying who it may have been who was providing you with the instructions or information or direction in the Castleton case? There would have been a whole selection of people who in turn would have raised it further on up their reporting structures. And so it was, a, to a certain extent, a movable feast. No individual stand out in particular there? Not particularly. Um, could we go over the page, please? You're passing on some good news, and over the page again, thank you, about the Castleton case. It's about the potential of settlement in that case. Uh, we're in November 2006. Um, this settlement doesn't ultimately happen. But if we, can we go over to page five, please? Thank you. And it's the second paragraph there. Um, you say there, about halfway down, uh, the benefit of having a judgment against him, against Mr. Castleton, in the full amount, is that we'll be able to use this to demonstrate to the network that despite his allegations about Horizon, we were able to recover the full amount from him. It will be of tremendous use in convincing other postmasters to think twice about their allegations. Um, so again, that, that seems to be the, a, a significant driving factor in respect of the post office's approach to this report. And by this time, it had become, in fact, a test case. Therefore, uh, if a judgment were obtained, it would have been of uh, benefit to Post Office Limited. Uh, we saw a moment ago that in September of 2006, BDO, the accountants, had written their initial concerns uh, and sent a letter to um, Mr Dilly. You're not sure whether you received that or not, but at this time, when you were talking about um, using his case as a message to other sub-postmasters. Do you think it likely that, in fact, you knew that there may, in fact, be problems with the Horizon system, as highlighted by BDO Stoy Hayward? Excuse me, can you just scroll back as to the date of this? Oh, this is November, isn't it? Yes, this is the 9th of November, 2006. The BDO letter was the 5th of September, 2006. If it assists... Um, and I'm going to take you to it shortly. The actual report from BDO, the um, draft report, was received on the 29th of November. So the final report was shortly after this email correspondence, but there had been correspondence from BDO to Mr Dilly. Excuse me, can you repeat the question again? You want me to answer? Um, at this time, the strategy seems to be convincing other postmasters to think twice about their allegations. Um, might you, by this stage, have known that, in fact, your own experts had raised an issue with the Horizon system? Very similar to the Cleveland's case. An issue, but we had a whole selection of witness statements from Fujitsu employees who were confident that their evidence uh, was going to be persuasive. Can we please look at poll 00069775, please? Um, 10th of November, so this is the day after mm -hmm. that email. Can we please look at page three, So if we scroll, sorry, slightly up the bottom of page two, we have an email from yourself, <clears throat> 10th of November, to that distribution list. So we have names such as Rod Ismay on there. If we scroll down, 
you are proposing that Mr. Castleton signs a form of words, and the proposal there is as follows. For him to say, I, Mr. L. Castleton, the former postmaster at Marine Drive Post Office, admit that a sum of money was owed by me to Post Office Limited as a result of errors which arose whilst I was the postmaster at the above office. Um, I had, I think that must be, I had thought that this debt arose due to a malfunction on the horizon system, but I, I think that must be now, except that I was mistaken and that the debt arose out of human error. I declare that the horizon system did not contribute to the errors in any way and formally withdraw all statements I made to the contrary. Um, so there is a form of words there that clearly suggests that the horizon system didn't contribute to the errors. Uh, it, it says that the debt uh, arose out of human error. What evidence was there that the debt arose out of human error? The evidence of the witnesses from Fujitsu and Post Office Limited who had recreated the accountancy side of this debt action. Uh, and why do you say human error, though? Why, why is it not something else? How can you be sure, have sufficient certainty, that the debt arose out of human error? First of all, how can you be sure that there was a debt at all? If, if there was a wrong button pressed, for example, how could you be sure that there was an actual loss to the post office? Because Post Office Limited uh, staff had gone through the accounts and the materials at the branch and recreated various uh, cash accounts and other documentation to demonstrate that there was a, a, a valid debt. Well, there may have been figures showing that there was um, a, a debt, but in terms of an actual loss to the post office, how could you be sure of that? If they were of the opinion that there was a valid debt and there was sufficient documentary evidence and support, I was prepared to accept that position. You mentioned earlier that the case was about the size of the counterclaim and that's why you wanted to settle the case. Uh, if it was about the counterclaim, why would you be seeking to get Mr Castleton to s sign up to this statement? Because, as I've said earlier, by this time it had become, uh, due to publicity, uh, a test case in its own right. Was it very much like the Cleveley's case that you wanted to silence him? No. Why get him to sign up uh, to a statement such as that if you didn't want because silence? Because it, it would have... I didn't seek silence. It would have been of use to Post Office Limited in dealing um, with other suggestions that there might be issues with the horizon system. Isn't that entirely consistent with, for example, council's advice in the Cleveleys case that I took you to earlier uh, about the post office seeking to avoid publicity? I don't accept that. Whose idea was it to um, ask Mr Castleton to uh, use those form of words? Was it yours or was it someone else, and if so, who was it? I genuinely can't remember after this period of time. Um, supporting the Horizon system was very important to Post Office Limited at the time. But on the balance, <laughs> on the balance of probabilities, I think it was something that emanated from Post Office Limited, but that's purely my opinion. Yeah, I, I, like Mr. Blake, um, the expression Post Office Limited doesn't give me very much information because mm -hmm. ultimately it must have been a person or persons within Post Office Limited. So is your evidence to me that probably this form of words was suggested to you and you acted in effect as the go-between in passing it on 
but you can't remember who it was that suggested the form of words to you. I'm, so, I'm very sorry, but I, I can't assist you any further on this. All right. Mr. Talbot, it may assist. If we look at the email again, mm -hmm. if we go to the top of the email with the distribution list. Sorry, it's, it's page two, the bottom of page two. We have there the distribution list. So it's an email from yourself uh, to various people within the post office. Mm -hmm. um, were those people, on the whole, more senior to you, less senior? Um, Biddy Wiles and Claire Wardell, certainly within legal services. Um, I think that Mr Ismay, Richard Barker, <coughs> were more senior to me. I don't know the status about the others. And if we scroll down, we can see, you say above the highlighted passage, I have prepared a short statement, but would be very grateful for any improvements which you can suggest. Uh, so it certainly seems as though that form of words was very much your drafting. It may, it, it, it's a possibility. <laughs> I mean, would you have said, I have prepared a short statement if somebody else had drafted it? Probably not. Um, if we go to the first page, we then have Mr. Dilly commenting on it, and he seems to want to strengthen it further. Um, I think the additions he has, for example, are unreservedly withdraw the untrue allegations, uh, and also words at the bottom um, allegations about the horizon system and or its functioning. Um, do you remember having any views as to that form of words? No, it was just an alternative draft. Um, knowing what you already knew from, for example, the Cleveley's case, uh, did you think that then might have been an appropriate time to raise any concerns you had about the functioning of the Horizon system? As I've said previously, I draw a distinction under the Cleveley's case, and I did not think that that was the time uh, to draw a distinction. Ultimately, the approach there and the approach in the Cleveley's case was similar in that you were getting somebody to effectively shut up to use the words from, or keep their mouth shut, I think was the expression in the Cleveley's case. Was this again an attempt uh, to get Mr. Carlton to keep his mouth shut? No. It was a, um, a way of drawing litigation to a conclusion on the best possible terms for Post Office Limited. Would Mr. Castleton have been free to continue uh, saying that the Horizon system was not uh, functioning properly? If he had been prepared to uh, sign the Tomlin order, uh, that is maybe something we would have taken into consideration later. As it was, he uh, instructed his solicitors that he wasn't prepared to sign the Tomlin order. But had he signed up to that, would he have been free to uh, say that the problem was the Horizon system? I can't tell. That's not a situation that occurred. I mean, you, you've said that it wasn't intended to shut him up, but in reality, if he had signed what you were asking him to sign, would he have been free, in reality, to it, continue to make allegations? It's a hypothetical. It didn't occur. Uh, I agree. But can you answer the question? It didn't occur. What was your, I'm trying to get to your thinking behind uh, this form of words. You've said that it wasn't to shut Mr. Castleton up. Um, surely, if he had signed it, he could not have criticised the Horizon system. So the effect was intended to shut him up, was it not? 
I'm asking about your thinking behind the effect of making him sign up to such a stringent form of words. If he had signed it, which he didn't, uh, the litigation would have concluded. He would not have been able to comment further upon the Horizon system, and Post Office Limited would have been free to um, comment upon the Castleton situation as it chose. Do you not see parallels between the strategy that was adopted in the, in the Cleveley's case and the strategy that is being adopted here, that you are effectively uh, ensuring that somebody does not publicly criticise the Horizon system? There was no uh, diktat from on high dictating strategy within these two separate litigation cases. So you were an individual who was involved in both cases. The strategy seems to be the same. Was that therefore coming from you? I dealt with both cases separately and individually and came to the, the same advice in both. Uh, and was it entirely a coincidence that the strategy adopted in both was to try and prevent public criticism of the Horizon system? Post Office Limited was concerned to uh, preserve the integrity of the Horizon system. There is no doubt about that. As the Chair has said, Post Office Limited is not a very helpful description of who it was that was concerned. You were involved in both of these cases. Was this your strategy? It is... I believe the strategy of Post Office Limited, though I cannot speak to Post Office Limited, uh, communicated through myself as the solicitor dealing with these two litigation cases. Can we please look at poll 00069955, please? This is the draft report from BDO Stoy Hayward. And it's page four. This is, you'll have seen, this is a document that I took Mr. Dilly to. Um, we have a summary there, and the very first of his conclusions, or of BDO's conclusions, are, uh, is the only indications of possible computer problems that are apparent from the accounting records are three very small differences in the cash account. Um, so having identified there that there are possible computer problems, were you aware of that? I would have seen a copy of this report at the time it was created. Is that in some way consistent with the expert report in the Cleveley's case of possible computer problems? On, based on two wholly different set, sets of facts, uh, BDO Stoy Hayward were ostensibly a firm of accountants, <clears throat> not IT experts. Two cases in two years. Uh, two expert reports, both identifying possible computer problems. Did that not cause you to pause for thought? At the time, no. Why wasn't this report ultimately disclosed to Mr. Castleton? I've seen an, ex uh, an email exchange between Stephen Dilley and myself, and I've racked my brains, and I cannot recall why it wasn't disclosed. Did you discuss that report with anybody at the post office? I genuinely cannot recall after this period of time. Did that report not make you question whether the infallibility of the Horizon system was now uh, in question, in doubt? The um, sums in the report are tiny in the extreme and we had become aware of potential glitches that were assured by Fujitsu uh, that they were rare 
unusual, extreme, capable of being identified and therefore excluded when Fujitsu were asked to look at horizon data. Given that there were potential glitches, do you think it was right to be trying to get Lee Castleton to sign an undertaking not making allegations about the horizon system when your own expert had identified at least one issue and, as you say, Fujitsu themselves uh, ha had accepted that there were potential glitches? At that time, I was tasked with obtaining a satisfactory resolution of this litigation from the perspective of Post Office Limited. Were you personally <laughs> satisfied that that was the correct approach, the ethical approach, for example? It was the approach I adopted at the time. And we know you adopted that approach, but did you think it was right at the time? I don't think I considered it. Do you now, looking back at it, think it was the right approach? Given the information that has become aware in the public arena since the Bates trial, I do not any longer consider that that was the right approach to have adopted. But then, given the information that's become public since Bates, I think it was wrong the proceedings were ever issued against Mr. Castleton. Um, Bates, of course, was much later. Yes. You're here in 2006. You've got the BDO report. You've got, as you've said, um, acceptance from Fujitsu that there were potential glitches. Looking back at it then, with the information you had then, do you consider that it was right to try and get Lee Castleton to sign an undertaking not making allegations about the Horizon system in light of the information that you had at that time? I believe that it was because my job was to conclude litigation in a satisfactory fashion as far as Post Office Limited were concerned. Can we look at poll 00070160, please? We're now on the 5th of December 2006, so quite close to the trial in the Castleton case. And we have there um, an email from yourself to Stephen Dilley um, talking about a case called Brown. And you say apparently Brown is going to be a problem because it's a case where the post office admitted that there was a problem with the system and replaced it. I'm hoping this is a one-off event like a power out outage or something of the like. I will investigate further tomorrow. Um, very close to trial. Did this cause you to pause for thought at all? The consequence of the list of parties, including Mr. Brown, who I believe Mr. Castlevan had indicated he was going to call to trial, and some information about what they were likely to say, made me go to Post Office Limited and Fujitsu uh, to try and investigate, to acquire as much information about these cases as I could, and to relay what information I acquired to Mr Dilley. I'm going to move on to a, a different topic, and that's the topic of costs. Can we please go back to a document we've already looked at, which is poll 00070811. Uh, this was the email, I, I think you'll recall, from Stephen Dilley to yourself, mm -hmm. and at the bottom where he says that, as previously discussed, essentially um, costs will be disproportionate, but there will be broader implications. This is just to refresh your memory of that particular document. I'd now like to go to poll 00119897. And this is a document from the 18th of August, 2006. 
um, from Cheryl Woodward to Stephen Dilley. She says, I've passed the case on to a senior manager who's going to speak to Mandy Talbot regarding not being happy about the costing of this matter going to trial. Uh, do, do you remember about the costing, you not being happy about the costs? No, I, I'd never seen this uh, email before disclosure. Okay. Um, I'm going to look at a policy it comes later. It's poll 00084977. Uh, this is a policy that the copy that we have, the version that we have, postdates this particular case. It's December 2009. Um, I'd like to take you to page 17 of this. Is this a, is this a document that you're familiar with at all? Sorry. I had no recollection of this document whatsoever. And although the cover sheet... Uh, is December of '09. If you look at the date at the bottom of most of the appendices, it is August of 2010. Yes. Therefore, I have no knowledge whether this was actually ever implemented at all. There's something I'd just like your view on. It. It's page 17, mm -hmm. and it's if we scroll down, it says there. The write-off authority levels are fairly transparent. The decision-making process to write off debt is usually where the cost of recovery outweighs the debt, i.e. very high legal costs, and or the debt is unrecoverable, e.g. insufficient evidence, legalities, uh, etc. Um, it's important to note that every case is unique and therefore all cases are assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, it seems to suggest that certainly a consideration in, in writing off debt is whether the case would be very high legal costs uh, and whether the debt was unrecoverable. Were those considerations that you were asked to take into account in relation to Mr Castleton's case, irrespective of the fact that this policy comes later, but those considerations, do they feature in your thinking at all? No, on the basis that the case and having a, a judgment that would be beneficial to Paul was considered to be so important to the business. The document you've just referred to uh, was, in my opinion, the very first attempt by Post Office Limited to, in effect, take an overview as to the whole sub-postmaster estate. I think before that, there was no a single strategy behind anything. So there was no policy in place about, uh, for example, the expenditure of disproportionate costs in a case. No. Was there no policy on when matters needed to be raised with senior management within no. the post office? Although I had worked for two city firms for a very short period of time, um, I didn't really have any experience of management. When I first came into post office legal services, I wasn't aware of the lack of structure uh, that would be apparent in most firms and most organisations in terms of reporting matters upwards or obtaining uh, instructions coming downwards. It just wasn't there. So, so what was your view of the post office as an organisation in the way that it was run in respect of the uh, bringing of actions, uh, management of actions against sub-postmasters? This is my own personal opinion. I could never understand why in some cases actions were taken, because as I said, the way the system was set up enabled departments to go out straight to external lawyers without referring to in-house legal assessment at all. And why on other occasions, the appropriate thing considered was to get the security teams involved and thereafter refer it to the prosecution or criminal uh, litigation department. Uh, I want to move on to a different topic, which is um, 
Mr Carstensen's health and costs and issues of bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. Can we look at poll 00069766, please? Thank you. If we could go to the, sec the, the bottom email, please. Um, we have an email from Mark Turner, solicitor in the commercial group of Roe Cohen solicitors, and um, he is emailing Stephen Dilly, and this is forwarded on to you. And he says, um, I've just tried to speak to Mr. Castleton, but I've been informed by his wife that he's rather unwell, uh, is in bed on his doctor's instructions, and is on some pretty strong medication to treat the stress-related condition that led to his hospitalization last week. Uh, as a result of the medication, he is somewhat out of it and apparently not in any fit state to provide me with instructions. That's the 15th of November 2006. And if you scroll up, you can see that Stephen Dilley forwarded that to you by way of an update. There's another email, poll 00069722. Two days later, the 17th of November. Um, this is when settlement was being um, discussed with uh, Mr. Castleton's solicitors. If we, if we look at the email at the bottom, it says, Dear Mandy, please see below from Castleton's solicitors. I've spoken to him and chased him to sign the consent order. He's going to call Mr. Castleton's GP today to check that Castleton has the mental capacity to give him instructions. And then if you look at the top email from yourself to Stephen Dilley, you say, noted, it's frustrating, uh, given that hopefully the settlement will be concluded shortly. Were you aware of any policies within the post office addressing what to do uh, if a party was hospitalized through stress? Pardon me. I wasn't aware of any policy within Post Office Limited itself uh, relating to the physical or mental health of a party. If we look at poll 00070210, please. There is a, an agreement between the Post Office and Bond Pierce. Um, this is a, called a sub-postmaster and commercial litigation protocol. Do you remember this document? I didn't until the uh, additional disclosure. I don't know if this was created uh, before the Castleton case or as a consequence of the Castleton case. I just can't remember the date of it. It has you down as the legal services representative. For sub-postmaster cases. Yes. yes. So d does that suggest that you were responsible within the post office for sub-postmaster cases? Within my small area of civil litigation, uh, I was the liaison between Bon Pierce over these matters whether I was the liaison with all of the other regional firms on sub-postmaster cases, I can't recall. Could we go down to the second page? The bottom of the second page. And there's reference there to significant slash sensitive cases. And it says that bond peers should notify the client and yourself of all significant and sensitive cases. And then it gives some examples. Um, now, stress, bullying, harassment, I, am I right to understand that that's not in the context of the conduct of the litigation? That, that means the topic of the litigation, whether it's a... Uh, I'm trying to recall whether Bon Piers dealt with employment, tri employment cases where uh, a provision like that would have been far more relevant. If we scroll down the list of significant and sensitive cases, do you consider the Lee Castleton case to have been a significant or sensitive case falling within any of those criteria? As it developed, yes. Uh, and which one would that be? 
although it refers to case values in excess of 500,000, I actually am of the opinion that any case involving a quarter of a million is also something that should have been reported on. Um, we know that you were, of course, aware of this particular case. Mm -hmm. um, and if we scroll up, this, all, all this agreement means is that you would be notified. Or, yeah. um, was there an equivalent policy within the post office to um, notify those within management, for example, of those kinds of cases? No, there wasn't. That I am aware of. If we can, uh, I want to address now his bankruptcy. Can we look at poll 00113487, please? And it's page seven of this, this pack of documents. Page seven. Thank you. It's that middle email from yourself mm -hmm. uh, to Martin Mitchell uh, of the post office. Do, do you recall who that was? I assume somebody within the error resolution team, because I think that as a sub-postmaster deficiency, theirs would have been the department tasked with recovering the deficiency. Thank you. Um, we're now in 2007, so it's after the original court case in, in the Castleton case. And you say there, he has declared himself bankrupt, which was expected, uh, and we are still awaiting details of the valuation. After a year, if he hasn't sold the property, the rights of his kids to have a house over their heads becomes an irrelevance. And as the largest creditor, we can put the property up for sale through a trustee in bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. um, you say there it, it was expected that he would declare himself bankrupt. Was that something that uh, you were aware of during the proceedings? During the proceedings? Yes. No. Um, I think in the period after the trial, it was suggested. Given the value of the claim uh, and given the strategy that the post office ad adopted, which was to essentially, as you've accepted, make it an example of Mr. Castleton uh, for wider purposes to dissuade other sub-postmasters from bringing actions, uh, did you think that it was proportionate for the post office to seek to recover its costs through the sale of Mr. Castleton's home? There had been opportunities at the time of the proposed Tomlin order um, to have settled the matter without the then additional costs of the trial. Um, as we had been, as Post Office Limited had been put to the cost of the trial, uh, it was just normal litigation tactic to try and recover whatever costs we could using legal methods. Uh, there's an email from Stephen Dilliot that I can take you to. It's poll 00072206. This is even later. This is now 2009. Um, you may recall from Mr. Dilly's evidence, it's the bottom email where he says it's frustrating that there's no financial recovery in this instance, although we knew that the prospects were slim, particularly after he was made bankrupt. Post Office Limited's main goal in pursuing Mr. Castleton was achieved in that we have a good judgment precedent which helps us to defend the horizon system. Do you think it was fair to bankrupt Mr. Castleton in pursuit of that wider goal? Mr. Castleton chose to bankrupt himself but it was a legitimate, um, it was legitimate on the part of Post Office Limited as the major creditor to seek to recover what costs it could. You've been very frank about this in your witness statement, and I'd like to turn that up, please. So, could we have a look at um, WITN 08500100? That's um, Ms. Tol Mrs. Talbot's witness statement. 
and it's page 19 that I'd like to look at. And it really draws the themes that I've been exploring just now of costs and bankruptcy uh, together. It's page 19 of, of the witness statement. Thank you. So at the, at the end, at uh, the bottom of that page, please. Um, you say there at the bottom, it begins at the very last line, uh, the tactic of, and if we go over the page, the tactic of the post office was to draw the costs position to the attention of Mr. Castleton, then to overwhelm Castleton with evidence and preserve the trial date of early December. I refer to the telephone attendance notes, etc. Uh, these would have been standard tactics in high litigation cases. Uh, pausing there, uh, do you see the post office as in any way different to a normal litigating partner? I don't, I don't think that I do see it as different to any other um, client. And can we go on to the next paragraph, in fact, paragraph 44, page 21. Sorry, it's 43, in fact. Um, thank you. You say at the top of that page, page 21, so over to the next page, please. You say, a defendant's well-being was not considered by the post office as relevant to the manner in which litigation was conducted unless or until the defendant or those acting on his behalf made a relevant application to the court, assuming that litigation had already commenced. Um, can you assist us with, with what you mean there? Um, did, did at no stage the post office consider uh, the well-being of a party unless that party had made an application to the court? I can't speak as to Post Office Limited, but within civil litigation, we wouldn't unless and until the defendant or those acting for him had made the appropriate formal application to the court. I don't know what consideration Paul took before deciding to send the matter out to external solicitors to issue proceedings. I just don't know whether they took somebody's physical or mental health into consideration. So if we look at paragraph 44 below it, you say, in general, the physical or mental well-being of a sub-postmaster may well have been considered a relevant factor prior to the decision to refer a matter out to agents, but that was a matter for the post office. I would not have been aware of any decisions taken in this respect and do not know if this was considered in this case, civil litigation were never asked to the best of my knowledge. Right. So uh, to try and understand the process, you would receive a case from somewhere within the post office? Where in particular would you receive a case relating to a sub-postmaster? It could have come from um, the teams dealing with sub-postmaster deficiency debt. In the case of Mr. Castleton, it was already sent out <coughs> by Ms. Woodward to Bond Pierce without us in house solicitors having any knowledge of it. So would the in-house solicitors not have a say as to whether the physical or mental well-being of a sub-postmaster was a relevant factor in continuing a case? Continuing with a case? Yes. Um, as, I refer, as I refer to in my statement several paragraphs before, it would only have become an issue if a formal application had been made to the court. I never knew of a case where we were asked to buy Post Office Limited to keep them apprised of 
what may ha be happening with the physical or mental condition of a defendant. So do you think you did or didn't keep people apprised of Mr Castleton's well-being uh, in the broader... I was never process? asked to do so specifically. And it would not have been normal in general high-value litigation. Can we look at poll 0, 0, 0, 0072991, please? And it's the second page. Um, we have an email there from Joseph Napier, who is a partner in Napier and Sons. Um, this is, we're now December 2010, so further on, a year on. Mm -hmm. Um, and he says there in the second paragraph, I've had discussions with, um, and this is somebody called Catherine uh, McAlney, um, with her solicitor. They're still making some noises regarding the horizon system, but I'm not getting the impression that they expect their arguments to bring them very far. Um, McAlney is in financial difficulty. She's trying to sell land, etc. And then your response above is, Joe, thank you for the update in this matter. We've recently won a prosecution of a postmistress by the name of Misra, and as a result, we anticipate that the complaints about the Horizon system may decline. I presume that her complaints about Horizon are generic rather than specific. Mm -hmm. um, this is a later case dealing, again, with complaints about uh, Horizon, and there is mentioned in that email from the solicitor about financial difficulties. Um, am I right to read into that, that Mr. Castleton's case was uh, not unusual in the respect of uh, the ultimate result causing significant financial difficulties to a sub-postmaster? I have no idea. We were never tasked with keeping any sort of financial record or any other sort of record about sub postmaster deficiency cases until such time as the Andy Greening uh, document, uh, end-to-end postmaster debt, in the August of 2010. And even then, I don't know whether that was ever properly implemented. So throughout your years in the legal department at the post office, uh, did you not yourself see trends rising? I was relation? never asked to look for trends. You weren't asked to look for trends, but did you not sense any trends yourself? As I said earlier, ordinarily, when I wasn't dealing with cases like Mr. Castleton, that were truly extraordinary, I would spend one, maybe two hours a week on these matters, uh, suppose master deficiency. It was a very, very small part of my caseload. I'm going to move on to a different topic. Um, so I think I'll continue. We have 20 minutes before one o'clock. I, I think I'll press on. By all means, uh, you, you take it as you think appropriate, Mr. Blake. Thank you. Uh, involvement in criminal cases. You address this in your witness statement. It's paragraph 54 of your statement, where you say civil litigation solicitors would have no interest or involvement in a criminal case until it had been concluded. Can you assist us with how those teams were separated? Were they physical separations? When I first joined legal services, we were in a tower block in Croydon and the legal services departments uh, were spread out on two separate corridors, two separate floors. The criminal department was down another corridor, in effect physically separated, from the general civil litigation team. And by about 2006, and I'm basing this on disclosure that uh, was made on Tuesday, 
the prosecution criminal team was based in Victoria uh, in central London. So we were geographically uh, in separate places for uh, the middle to latter portion of 2000 to 2010 and physically separated in terms of being two separate ends of a divided corridor uh, when we were all working together in Impact House. There was a, um, a sort of landing with two sets of double doors and criminal and prosecution were down one end and civil down the other end. Did you share any joint meetings? I think it extremely unlikely until possibly the 2000s because... Do you mean 2000s or do you mean uh, sorry, post-2010? Uh, 2010. Uh, because from 2000 to the end of 2009 and possibly way into 2010, our only real connection with prosecution was cases where they had not been able to achieve uh, recovery of outstanding debt. Therefore, they would prosecute an individual and if they forgot to apply for a compensation order or the court wasn't minded to grant it, uh, then, and only then, would a case from prosecution be referred to ourselves. Um, and how about management? Did you share a, a, the same management structure? Uh, as I say, I worked to uh, either my team leader or to the head of civil litigation, criminal and prosecution, work to Mr. Rob Wilson. So we didn't share a management structure in that respect. And did their managers share a manager, if you're able to assist us with that? I believe that Rob Wilson, if I, if I can go back to the early days, I believe that Rob Wilson and Joe Ashton, who were respectively heads of criminal and heads of civil litigation, reported directly to Catherine Churchyard, who was the solicitor to the post office at that time. And I believe that that's a structure that was maintained subsequently. Thank you. Can, can we look at poll 00083161, please? And it's page two of that document. Um, Again, I'm going to take this broadly chronologically looking at involvement in criminal cases. If we could look at the bottom email, there is an email um, forwarded by you, but it's originally from Graham Ward. Um, who was Graham Ward? I think if we scroll down, we can actually. There's see possibly that. his title on the next page. There is. It says Casework Manager, Post Office. Yeah. limited investigations team. So he was part of the investigations team, was he? Yes, and they worked primarily on criminal cases. Thank you. And if we go up to the bottom of the page before, so the bottom of page two, a little bit further. So it's the bottom of that page, thank you. Um, he says, Mandy, Keith for info, that's Keith Baines. Mm -hmm. As discussed yesterday, please find attached the statement from Jan Holmes, which was used in a prosecution of a counter clerk at Camberwell branch in 2002. Um, pausing there, we know that that was Tracy Felstead, who was 19 years old at the time, and her conviction has subsequently been overturned. Mm -hmm. It says, I would suspect that Jan Holmes' statement is more or less exactly what you'll need should the Castleton case proceed all the way. However, I seem to recall that at the time, uh, as it was out of the normal, this statement did cost us an arm and a leg, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, did you on occasion, therefore, have sight of um, statements and other documents that were used as evidence in criminal proceedings? Very, very rarely. At this time, 
Um, we were trying, uh, and Stephen Dilley was trying, to obtain witness statements. And I think Graham thought it might be of assistance if Stephen got in touch with Jan Holmes because he had prepared a witness statement in another case. Uh, looking at it, uh, it appears possibly the witness statement from Jan Holmes was attached to this email. Um, oh yes, it was. Revised witness statement, Jan Holmes. Yes, so I, I would have seen a copy of that witness statement at the time. Um, was this particular to you and your role that you are being involved uh, or sent matters relating to criminal prosecutions? You've said that your team had little involvement. No. This was as a consequence of Stephen trying to identify people within Paul and Fujitsu who were capable of giving witness statements on this type of case. So is this relatively isolated? Oh, right? yes, absolutely. Can we look at poll 00067487? December 2006. Um, so before we were December 2005, so a year later, mm -hmm. we have a letter... And it's uh, relating to Josephine Hamilton, sent to Cheryl Woodward and the agent's debt team. Uh, and it says as follows, if we could go halfway down the page, it's that middle paragraph. It says, Miss Hamilton is likely to allege that she was inadequately trained on the Horizon system. It is possible that she may also contend that there were errors with the Horizon software, although her solicitors have not specifically said so. Her letter does, however, hint at it. In light of that, I am copying this letter to Mandy Talbot. Um, now, these are the criminal proceedings against Josephine Hamilton. Again, another case that we know has subsequently been quashed. Um, it was written, in fact, the day before she first appeared in a magistrate's court, and it refers there to her potentially challenging horizon and copied to you in light of that. Why? would matters challenging Horizon be copied to you? I'm not 100% certain, though as this is Cheryl Woodward, and she was the lady who gave instructions to begin proceedings in Castleton, she may have thought it appropriate to tell <coughs> Hugh James to keep me copied in for that reason. Um, this was something that was referred to me for information, as far as I was concerned. No more. I mean, if we, sorry, if we could zoom out slightly. This is a letter from Hugh James. The fact that they knew that you would be interested in cases relating to errors within the Horizon software, should we not read anything into that? Hugh James had informed me of the possibility of an embryonic class action. As such, um, I may have been copied in uh, on that basis. Were you starting at this point to coordinate yeah. cases? Yeah. Uh, this is precisely the time when, of course, the Castleton case was going on. Um, did you tell Hugh James that you had a similar case uh, Mr. Castleton's case, a similar case where the Horizon software was being challenged. I believe that I asked Bon Pierce to liaise with Hugh James and any, by implication, any other external agents on sub postmaster cases because. I wanted to ensure that proceedings were not issued again where the documentary evidence wasn't in apple pie order and that we wouldn't be able to prove on the arithmetic that losses had been sustained at individual branches. 
mean, undoubtedly a serious matter, Mrs. Joseph, Ms. Josephine Hamilton uh, being prosecuted shortly before her appearance in court, you're being told about it. Mm -hmm. um, did you think at that stage to raise, for example, that you had by then received two expert reports um, where allegations were being made about the Horizon system or concerns were being raised about the Horizon system? No, I did not. Um, did you tell them, for example, that you had that Cleveley's case where the independent expert had raised concerns about the Horizon I system? I believe I merely read the letter and probably filed it. Um, did you think, with criminal cases being brought to your attention, uh, that you had any duties of disclosure in respect of those cases, of your, in respect of your knowledge of any problems with the Horizon system? Now, at the time, I dealt with each and every case on its particular facts and as a singular item. Can we please look at poll 00053778, please? Thank you. Can we turn to page five? That's the bottom of page five. <clears throat> An email from yourself to, uh, is it Michelle? Michelle. Michelle and Michelle Graves. Who, who is Michelle Graves? Somebody within Post Office Limited, but unfortunately I cannot rem remember which department after this period of time. Um, the subject there is an Eleanor Dixon. Um, we're in January 2010, and, and you say this. You say, as you know, the business is prosecuting a former postmistress who is adducing all sorts of statements and comments from former postmasters in support of the contention that Horizon is the cause of all evil and that they were perfect postmasters. Mm. Is, is that a little sarcastic? I do very much regret the uh, language I used in this. And as I've said in my statement, with perfect hindsight, uh, they were right to so adduce. Um, you say, I attach a statement from Dixon along the, those lines. Please can you locate any material which the post office may still have on this lady so we can assist the barrister who is prosecuting the case on our behalf. Um, so having said that getting involved in criminal cases was quite rare, we again have another case here where you seem to be involved in the I believe what I said was it was quite rare until 2010, if I didn't say that. Yes, I, th I think you're absolutely right. Why was it in that. 2010 that you became involved in criminal proceedings? In 2010, um, the criminal department uh, began the prosecution of Ms. Misra. And for the first time I can ever recall I was approached by a clerk in the prosecution team on behalf of a criminal barrister and asked to provide him with information about civil cases that had been dealt with um, in the civil courts where Horizon was challenged or alternatively um, he may have provided me with a list of cases that he wanted additional information on. I can't quite recall which of those approaches were taken. Well, I have a document that may assist you in that regard. It's poll 00055212. Um, this is 2nd of September 2010. Can we scroll down, please? This is the case uh, of the Crown against Gurdip Dahl. Mm -hmm. And you, um, it's John L. Singh writing to you. So John L. Singh, the senior lawyer in the Criminal Law Division, writing to you and say, I, I have this case. Can the defendant 
uh, have identified previous cases where the Horizon case system has been criticised, namely Lee Castleton, Joe Hamilton, Noel Thomas, Amar Bajaj, Alan Bates, Alan Brown, and Julie Ford. I understand that you and Council Warwick Tatford looked at a number of similar cases, of cases in similar circumstances. In my case, of Misra, and I would be grateful if you could give me details of that and whether you can identify any other cases listed above as to whether there were any questions or criticisms of the Horizon system. Does that assist you? Yes. And can you tell us then what, what it was that you were being asked to do or what you understood the task to, to involve? I believe that Mr Phil Taylor of the Criminal Law Department contacted me, it would either have been very late December 2009 or early January 2020, and asked me for information, I, I believe, on the Castleton case. And I tried to retrieve what information we had and supplied that to the barrister. I think from other internal documentation that the barrister may even have spent a couple of days at our office looking at materials on the car case of Castleton. Now, Joe Hamilton, as you say, was a prosecution case, so I would never have had any information on that. Uh, Calendar Square, the only information I had was that um, provided by yesterday's witness about a particular glitch that you know, became known as the Calendar Square issue, Calendar Square problem. So although Mr Singh has asked me for information across all of these cases, I would only ever have been able to provide information about civil actions to him. And I believe that my ultimate response in the December of 2010 was along the lines of, I would have thought you already had this material as your barrister in uh, the case of Misra spent a number of days with us. Those are all specific named cases. I think mm. he also says whether you can identify any other cases mm. uh, listed above and whether there are any questions or criticisms of, of the Horizon system. Did you, at that point, carry out any exercise to look back at the cases you had been involved in over the years to see if there had been any issues involving the Horizon system that might be disclosable in those criminal cases? No, I didn't. Um, so I think that's an appropriate time to pause for lunch. Yeah. Um, could we come back at two o'clock, please? Yes, of course. Thank you very much. <laughs>